Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast, brought to you by Pacific Calls. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world-famous Andy Shaver. The day's here, Jeff. You got your white whale on. Mr. Uh, Reed Timmer, we're excited to have you, bud. How's it going? Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. Um, I think Jeff has an erection over there. I can't tell. (laughs) I can't tell from here, but it looks maybe like it. I got to tell you, we have had bullfighters on. We have had guys that crawl under houses catching rattlesnakes. We have even had a guy that told the story about his wife getting drunk and pissing in bed. How about the guy that uh, I think gets you, crabs? You have, yeah, we've had we've had Sean Dwyer from Deadliest Catch. I think you've got a bigger set than all of them. I mean, you, you, the things oh. that you do, it's it's insane. You're a madman. <laughs> well, I agree. I agree with you on the madman part. I think you know, uh, t- 25 years now going after those storms. My vehicle's a little bit beat up. Just got back from a storm chase. Uh, out in Louisiana, into southern Mississippi, big QLCS event. But I've been in your guys' area quite a bit, out in Knox City in northwest Texas as well. Yeah. Uh, definitely some monster hailstones out there. Now, Reed, I, I'm i very amateur chaser, but if it's in our area, I chase, and I'll go clear to the Kansas border. And one of the things I do is we cheat off of you. And it's just not <laughs> me because I know a lot of guys do because you'll be on the side of the road and you'll hear somebody say, well, Reed's 17 miles north of us, and everybody goes 17 <laughs> miles north. <laughs> yeah, but I drive in circles. I drive in circles a lot, that's for sure. But, you know, sometimes when I'm out there, we'll get some vehicles behind me. And then I start feeling the pressure because I want to get them a tornado as well. So, you know, the pressure's on once we get out there in a big group and especially chasing out in Dixie Alley. You know, it could be a little bit more difficult to chase down the tornadoes, quite a track meet out there. Uh, but I know we've met on the side of the road a few times out there in northwest Texas. What, what do you think th- – this is – Strictly for me as an amateur, do you see it getting more and more dangerous because there's so many more people chasing that was chasing 10, 15 years ago? Well, it's definitely getting more dangerous in terms of the other drivers, I think. And that's probably the most dangerous part of of storm chasing, certainly. And you put so many miles on on the road and drive through the most extreme conditions on the planet. I mean, I've driven through like two feet of flood water. You know, driven through softball-sized hail that blows the window out into my face and driven through tornadoes and Category 4 hurricane eye walls. But all that is is one thing. You can kind of adjust for the conditions with Mother Nature. You can bury your car in a ditch if you find yourself in a tornado. But the other drivers, are it's a little bit less predictable. If someone comes in and hits you head on or something, uh, it could be a, a little bit more dangerous. But there are a lot more chasers out on the road. But I also think it's a good thing because the more popular that storm chasing is uh, getting, it's almost impossible for a tornado to go unreported these days. It's uh, you know pretty much if there's a tornado, it's going to be seen by storm chasers. What I find fascinating is you've been doing this 25 years, right? 20, 25 years. You yeah, ever since I got my driver's license. You so. were doing this before Google Maps on your cell phone could tell you, hey, turn right here, turn left here. I can only imagine some of the situations that you got yourself into just by not knowing. Like, where the hell is my next turn going to be? Yeah, that was one thing. I, I'm kind of in the generation that started off with the paper maps and doing the old school navigation. And uh, then we were checking into libraries to try to get a radar image just to see where the other storms are located. And now it's crazy. There's so much real time information coming in. Every storm chaser, you know, we're all sharing opinions and everything. And it's almost like there's too much information coming in. And I, I thought it was a little bit easier storm chasing back in the day when you had a little bit less information. You had a radar image maybe every 20, 30 minutes or so. There was still a lot of mystery. A tornado could still just come out of the rain and slam into your vehicle, which I kind of liked. But it also taught me how to how to read the wind direction and chase a tornado using my eyes purely. And uh, I think that that definitely helps when you're storm chasing. I think maybe a lot of the newer generations are, are more data driven, you know, but they're experts at reading radar and uh, absolute experts at forecasting, you know, because they've been teaching themselves since a young age because there's so many resources online and everything uh, these days. But I almost feel like there's too much information now during modern times. I miss the days of 
navigating with a roadmap and getting lost, you know, or the pages blow out the window. <laughs> when did when did you start getting into storm chasing? You, you grew up in Michigan, correct? Am I right? Yeah, that's right. I grew up in Michigan, uh, moved to Oklahoma in 1998 to go to the University of Oklahoma. But I loved weather and storms ever since I was about five years old. So uh, one, one time my dad was taking us to go catch minnows uh, to go to go fishing up in Michigan and a tornado uh, warning happened. So the tornado sirens were blaring and I was about five years old. And apparently that's when I saw my first tornado. There was a rope tornado just to the north. And everyone was freaking out, you know. My, my mom was yelling out at the porch trying to get my dad to walk faster, and he's just going slow as ever. But I think I remember the chaos of the moment. You know, I remember the newspaper delivery guy just hauling ass. He wasn't even holding on to the handlebars, just booking it, you know, riding with no handlebars. But I remember it like it was yesterday, just the chaos of the tornado warning. And I was hooked ever since uh, to the science and, 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 and all that and uh, the meteorology and I didn't go through puberty till I was about 25 years old, so I was in Science Olympiad. You know, I collected insects and uh, did all that kind of stuff. Uh, tree identification, I was big into catching snakes and lizards. But, you know, weather and storms was always my passion and the science behind it. Always wanted to be a storm chaser. And as soon as I got my driver's license, I realized I didn't have to wait for the storms to come to me anymore, but I could drive after them. Is, <clears throat> is there anywhere that you won't chase uh, storms and stuff? Because Jeff doesn't like to get where there's a lot of trees and, and things like that just because you can't really see. And he hates uh, Metroplex. Yeah. He won't go to Dallas. Yeah, I don't like to be in Dallas because of, of traffic. The, the traffic. Yeah, the traffic is a big issue, you know. But if there's a tornado in the metro, then, you know, sometimes I have to go there and just battle the traffic and adjust and just try to get into the path of the tornado. And if you get caught in a traffic jam, you know, you might have to get out of the car and go on foot or something like that. But uh, the metropolitan areas are kind of my big phobia is, you know, getting stuck in there, getting stuck in the traffic and the storm blows by you and then produces all the tornadoes off to your east. It's definitely happened to me quite a bit. But in terms of the natural terrain, there's nowhere I won't chase. I go into the mountains, mm -hmm. the Rocky Mountains, the Appalachians, the Ozarks. You know, the Ozark Mountains are probably some of the most difficult terrain to chase in because there are cliffs on either side of the road, big trees and everything. You know, beautiful terrain, though. But now with a drone, you can just use a Mavic drone and just pop it into the air like a periscope. Get above the trees. You can see any tornadoes that are coming at you. And uh, But I kind of like the feeling in the jungle a little bit, you know, in Dixie Alley and, you know, up into even further north in the forested terrain. It, it kind of feels almost cozy to me in there, you know, where the tornadoes coming at you. And, you know, I, I know that the trees are a little bit more dangerous, but it also gives it a little bit more mystery. You can see the base of the storm, but... You can't really see if there's a tornado yet until it's right on you. You almost have to be, in, you know, basically inside of the tornado uh, to see it. So that's definitely, definitely I didn't exciting. realize that storm chasing is, was such a thing <clears throat> up and uh, uh, up until just. I grew up in Wichita Falls, and in 1979, we got wiped that's... out by a big tornado, and I'll never forget that. The day I die, I'm going to remember that day and every detail about it because it. Did yes, you see I the tornado? The whole thing. It missed wow. my house by about wow. a half mile. My elementary school got wiped out. Uh, a bunch of schools wow. did. It was a it was a tor it was a horrible horrible day for Wichita Where Falls. Where did they just have that? Was it Decatur that had the tornado recently? Jacksboro. 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 But, and and those people at that school board ought to be given medals for uh, having the hindsight to put in a safe room for those kids. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was an EF3 tornado, too, kind of on the nose of the instability. So it was a little bit northwest of the big tornado prob probabilities as well. But that Wichita Falls tornado was a nasty one. It was, it was rated yeah, F4, it was, right? It was, I like, there were refrigerators it, was like, the it was about like the Moore tornado. I mean, the, the, it was a bad, bad yeah. tornado. But I grew up at that time. Well, I was watching old clips of it about five years ago, and there was guys that were weather chasers there. And they were chasing the storm, and they had the video from them guys. I thought – how in the hell? I never would have thought in 1979 there was guys with cameras chasing tornadoes. So that that was my oh, yeah. entrance into a tornado because after that... You had a friend it, die in it, didn't you? Yeah, he was yeah, playing with his brother? Yeah, he got a kid that um, I grew up with. But it, it was a yeah. horrible day. But after that, if there was a cloud that came up in, around Wichita Falls, everybody was paying attention to the weather. And you could tell it's been a long time since people don't pay attention yeah. like they used to. But... Mm -hmm. That was my indoctrination into chasing storms and wanting to be around storms. So then after I got into it, I chased it. But I noticed from like the, the, the late 80s on to now how much more popular it has become. Yeah, and I think the movie mm -hmm. Twister definitely uh, helped with that in 97. And there's rumors of a Twister 2 coming up too. So 
who knows if that'll make it even more popular. And Storm Chasers, of course, I think brought in a, the, the newer generation of chasers. And the youngest generation of chasers that's starting right now, I mean, they are really motivated. They're like having kids at 21 years old. It doesn't, they're not going to school for a meteorology degree. They're teaching themselves. They're starting these weather casts on social media. They're getting out there chasing armor in their vehicles. And they're already experts when they're starting to storm chase, you know, like right out of the gate because of all the material online, YouTube, all the educational stuff. And they're, they're picking out tornadoes on dual pole radar even before the weather service in a lot of cases. And it's remarkable, remarkable to see. I think that this next generation is really going to take our field to the next level. But yeah, but when you went back in the Wichita Falls, there were only a, in the in the 70s, there were only a handful of chasers back then. Uh, Tim Marshall is one of them uh, from North Texas. And actually, when I was younger, I sent a letter, a handwritten letter to Tim Marshall because I was such a big fan of his. And he responded right away, sent me a bunch of VHS tapes. And he was definitely instrumental in getting me to storm chase as well. And I think he might have been chasing. It might have been his video, but it was, it was amazing. I did not even know a storm chaser existed. And Wichita Falls had a really good Skywarn network back then because they'd been hit by a tornado in the 60s. So they were they they were pretty proactive on that, and it turned out to be a good deal. They saved a lot of lives. It could, I think 70 people died that day, and it could have been a whole lot worse. Was it a mile? It was, a, I think, a half. Almost a mile? Um, um, almost a mile wide, and it went from one end of town to the other. It wiped out. The best thing happened to that day was we were on Easter break from school, and if not, we would all had baseball practice and been all over town, and there would've, it would have been a whole lot worse. As the expert, because you are the expert. We've had guys that are good in their field on here, but you are the tornado. You're the weather Man. expert. The The movie <laughs> Twister. I think the movie Twister is really pretty realistic other than the flying cows and all the and the driving the truck through the house crashing on the, the highway. The actual chase stuff is really a lot like what chases are in a lot of ways. Do you, do you think it's a pretty realistic show, or do you think it's way too Hollywood? Yeah, I, I thought it was surprisingly really realistic. You know, you can get hung up on a couple of details here and there, you know, that might be a little bit off. But overall, I think it you know picked up on storm chasing and the future of storm chasing, too, because now we're launching these miniaturized sensors into tornadoes that are streaming data back live to a ground receiver in real time. And you can see the data, see how strong a tornado is. There's uh, mobile Doppler, uh, Doppler on wheels that are out there scanning the tornado with real time data coming in. So, I mean, even the concept of Dorothy with launching those live streaming sensors into the tornado and streaming data back as Lagrangian drifters was really kind of a vision into the future, uh, a future technology, uh, future tornado research when you could have miniaturized sensors that are affordable by storm chasers as well uh, to launch sensors into tornadoes. Uh, we just recently partnered with Mark Simpson, uh, who is a uh, chase and spin on t uh, Twitter. He's our, our head engineer and he's designing all these with his bare hands, these tiny little sensors. And before that, he was designing miniaturized sensors for the human brain. So uh, a sensor into a tornado is pretty easy yeah. for him, you know, but I think that kind of the movie Twister was definitely a look into the future. And I think kind of the camaraderie life on the road was was uh, was, was definitely a pretty accurate depiction. And I look forward are to Twister 2. Are you going to be in Twister 2, Reed? Uh, I don't. I don't think I'm going to be in it, but I was working a little bit with the writer of it, and uh, that it, there was talk that they were going to use some real footage as well. But I haven't heard about it in a little while, so you know, I still hope that it's happening. But it definitely sounded like it was something that was moving forward. They wrote the script and everything, and uh, but you know, if they were going to be using real footage, then we'd probably definitely have to be shooting during this peak season. But you know, the last I heard, it was still moving forward and. And it is definitely going to happen. Filming some, wasn't Val Castor and them doing some kind of filming last year in Oklahoma for something during last spring, during tornado season? Yeah, I think they might have been working for one of those other movies that were out there. I know there's that one with Alec Baldwin that's out there. Uh, Supercell, I think, that was happening. So, you know, I think he, he was like a former tour company operator, too. So I think that he was playing one of the bad guys. Uh, that no, gun, no guns, I hope. Uh, that fits him perfect, then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it wasn't playing me. <laughs> I started Extreme Tornado Tours. <laughs> what do you think about all the tours? I, and this is a politically tough question for you to answer because you deal with a lot of the guys. But do you feel like a lot of those guys are are unsafe with their clients and put them in bad situations? Or Because I know some guys that are professional ch chasers. Eric Burns is one. He's a very professional guy and a very good guy. Eric's oh, yeah, I know guy. Eric. But, what, but there's yeah. some of the guys I see that I think are just taking money from people. 
Yeah, Eric, Eric Burns used to do the the duck yeah, calls, yeah, right? He's, he's duck been hunting? on with us before. Eric's a good guy. He's an old friend of mine. He's a he's a real oh, real yeah, good guy. Oh yeah, I know Eric. Yeah, and he, he's a great a great uh, tour company as well. And a majority of the storm chasing tour companies that are out there are really good. They're run by veteran storm chasers, and you know, I mean, there there has been a couple situations where I think a van was rolled. And it was definitely a veteran chaser that that was uh, in charge of that tour. So I think that was just an isolated kind of a really unlucky incident. And so I think that um, uh, the tours are, are really reputable that are out there. I mean, it's still good to do your research, of course, and make sure that you go with a veteran storm chaser. But, you know, with the driving and and storms, I mean, there's certain there is definitely a little bit of danger that's involved with with storm chasing, whether you're with a tour or going out there with a smaller group, uh, certainly. But I think the tours are are definitely reputable. I started a tour company myself a while back called Extreme Tornado Tours. And uh, I ended up giving that that company to my friend, uh, Nick, who was running it. Uh, and they uh, and it was pretty wild. You know, the people that sign up for an Extreme Tornado Tour are probably crazier than the people <laughs> that are running the tour. You know, they go out there and I mean, they were you know, cracking beers on the road and like, then they check into a, a hotel and my friends were running it. You know, they were younger guys and they would pour dishwashing detergent into the hot tub in a day's in, and the whole thing would fill with suds. They'd get kicked out, you know, go drive into a tornado. And, I mean, they were pretty wild. Extreme Tornado Tours back in the day was probably one of the crazier ones. Now it's it's a lot safer, and I definitely recommend it. I'd recommend it back in the day as well. But overall, you know, I definitely support the tour industry, and I think it's a great way for people to get into storm chasing and learn the basics of storm structure and how to forecast and, and to also do I'll it tell you safely. What, you ride in a vehicle with someone all day long chasing storms, and I always go with friends of mine, so they're all friends, and I get along with them. I can't imagine being on a tour <laughs> with a bunch of strangers, strangers, and you'll be there for three days, and you know there's not going to be anything to chase. Yeah, but they definitely bond quickly on those tours. I mean, they become friends for life. They become friends with us as the guides. And there was one in 2012 when Extreme Tornado Tours is up there, and tornado touched down, and then softball-sized hail started coming in horizontally. And they went past us in the Extreme Tornado Tours van, and we drove by them just after the tornado passed, and the windows were blown out on the left side. of The whole van was blown out. And uh, I thought we were in big trouble, you know. And they jumped out of the van, and they're like, "Woo!" Just that would like be screaming. fun. They had blood, you know, <laughs> cut up arms and everything, and they loved it. You know, I, I met up with them afterward, and it was the time of their life, like a really life-changing experience. Uh, but you know, Extreme Tornado Tours now they don't get as close as we did. They're very safe tour company. All of them are safe, you know, and and reputable. And uh, so I would definitely recommend you know, tours to any listeners that, that want to get into storm chasing or go to a National Weather Service uh, Skywarn training course is another way to learn the basics and just watch videos on YouTube nonstop because there is a, a whole wealth of information out there on the internet to get into storm it chasing. It almost seems like you, and you mentioned this earlier, you know, you were of the generation like where you kind of had to, you learned the tornado by watching the tornado. Now this new generation, it's all technology and they've got radars on their phones and um, it, it, it's interesting that you're a throwback to, uh, just, I know what the storm's doing by watching the storm. And, you know, now you got kids that can tell you what the storm's doing by, they don't even have to see what the storm, they don't have to have to be there. They can just look on their phone and, oh, well, this is what it's going to do. And the tornado's going to drop out here. It almost seems like that, that wouldn't be as fun. It's not as easy as you're making it sound, Andy. Well, I understand that, but they can, you know. They can take yeah. they can take things and uh, with a high degree of accuracy predict whether or not it's going to spit out a, a tornado or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas in your day, you know, it's just you didn't have that. You you chase storms and hope for the best. Yeah, they have dual pole radar now too, so you can see debris when it gets lofted by a tornado, and you can have a tornado debris signature, and you can even see the tornado with radar without really having visual confirmation. But sometimes the tornadoes will happen further away from the radar site and they can't get picked up with those technologies. But but you still gotta chase the storm. And you know the newer generations are definitely learning storm structure as they're going just as rapidly as they learned how to forecast and all the technology. But I definitely think that having that visual side of learning storm structure helps immensely, especially for the mm -hmm. up close tornado chasing, which I consider an art form to do it safely. I think that there are a lot of storm chasers that are hanging back and shooting time lapses that are absolutely stunning, showing the structure and everything. I wish I could had the patience to do that and also had the equipment and the artistic ability, but I think it's equally as much of an art form getting close to a tornado safely. So I, I try to use 
different approach angles for certain different situations. And I like to go through the hook of the storm, which is called a hook slice maneuver, where you're kind of coming out the tornado from the rear. And if you get a flat tire, then just staying in one spot is still considered an escape route. But you also have a beautiful look at the tornado backlit. It's likely coming at you, so you can kind of get as close as you want. A lot of times there's very large hail falling too, which I love hail. As you've seen from my vehicle, it's covered in hail dents. I get the windows blown out like four or five times a year. But uh, Let's be honest, Reed. That's yeah. fun. That's sitting back taking pictures from miles away. That ain't no fun at all. Yeah, I mean, I bet it's fun for them as well. And the structure is, is immaculate too. So I, I think it's just as fun, but maybe a different kind of fun. But, you know, I definitely like to get up close to the storm and, that's all I know is storm structure from being right underneath the tornado and I'm looking right up at the cinnamon bun and tracking the dry slot, the clear slot when it's cutting into the base of the storm. And chasing at night too, I think it's, you gotta use all your senses. You have to listen for the tornado. You have to look at the rain curtains and see where the wind direction's going so you know where you are relative to the tornado. Anytime you get a westerly wind component, a lot of times you're behind the tornado. If you have northerlies or an easterly component to the wind, then you're more likely to potentially be in the path. And you can definitely see differences with the nature of the wind, too. It comes in these bands called mesomist or atomized rain that'll come in around a tornado, and you can start to recognize those cues. And just a couple days ago on the uh, west of Crockett, Texas, we were chasing a tornado at night. And we could hear it for like the first 15 minutes we were chasing it. We'd get out of the car and you could hear this crazy roar that was getting louder and louder. But there was hardly any lightning at the time. So you couldn't see exactly where the tornado was. You just knew it was coming right at us. And we're deploying sensors, you know, and the roar is getting louder and louder. And usually it's within about an eighth of a mile if it's making that really loud roar. And it sounded like a violent tornado to me because they, you know, the F4s, F5s kind of have that distinct, really low frequency waterfall kind of noise to it. So, but you have to use all your senses. And I knew it was moving at 50 or 60 miles an hour and we're driving and this car's almost stopped in front of us, you know, so I had to get around them and I thought it was about to hit us from behind and would have, you know, swept us all off the road. But thankfully it ended up being about 200 yards to the south of the road. And then finally lightning flashed and we could see the stovepipe and then it crossed the road just in front of us and lit up like the 4th of July. I mean, bright yellow, blue coloring, but Sadly, it caused a lot of damage to the west of Crockett. Uh, there were some injuries there. It hit a couple of mobile homes, and unfortunately, we did see the dark side that the tornadoes leave behind that day as well, as also happened you know, there in Round Rock and uh, north of Taylor and a bunch of tornadic supercells So you were just, you're just going to, like, you think it's going to come get you, and you're just going to grin and bear it, like, oh, it's going to take you. It's, it's just going to throw me around a little bit, and you're cool with that. I wanted to stay in front of it. I was trying to stay in but front of it, it at that time. But if it did take you, was, like, you're like, all right, we just got to grin and bear it. Yeah, I would have probably buried the car oh, in the really? ditch. That would be my first instinct, yeah, because we were starting to get southerlies. The rain curtains were starting to envelop the vehicle, and I mean, we were about to get hit by the tornado, and I had to zip around a the vehicle. There was a double yellow, unfortunately, there, so I had to zip around them really quick. It. Kept going, but it would have hit us because when the lightning flashed, the tornado was just in front of us off to the southeast. So if it was going right up the road that far west like we thought it was, then it probably would have hit us. And in that case, then I would bury the car in the ditch and – you know, it'd probably be okay. I well, think. Well, you know, um, but that's the that's the thing. So, <laughs> so if anybody can take anything away from this podcast, if a tornado is bearing down on you, just in the ditch. Well, yeah, and uh, and you know, bury the car in the ditch. And I would recommend not abandoning the vehicle. The the old guidance used to say to abandon the vehicle and get in a ditch. But then every blade of grass, every sand particle, everything that's coming could be really deadly on you know, for, for a human, if you're outside of the vehicle and uh, recent studies have shown that being inside of the vehicle, it can actually be pretty aerodynamic a bit. And, uh, you know, there's, I think that it increases your likelihood of surviving, but if it throws your vehicle, big problems, of course. So if you can bury your car in a ditch, the wind wants to go up and over the ditch a little bit, doesn't want to dig down in there. So that's what I would recommend. And I almost had to do that once in Canton, Texas. It always seems like Texas is where I <laughs> run into my problems. How, how many? Hold on. How many tornadoes have you been inside of and, and seen? You said the cinnamon bun. I've never seen that. I didn't even know that was a term. Yeah. Well, when we had the Dominator storm chasing vehicles, yeah. the armored tank like vehicles that we were intercepting tornadoes, we probably got in about a dozen or so. You know, a couple strong ones. And a bunch of bird fart tornadoes, as we call it. You know, the weaker, lower-end ones, like little vortices or noodle tornadoes. 
But the first two, the Aurora Nebraska one in June 17, 2009, we measured a 138.8 mile per hour wind in that. And the radar operator was in the back seat. He had a stream of blood that was coming out of his ear. And he had allergies, you know, from the spring mm-hmm. allergies. And uh, the, the pressure fall was so dramatic that it blew out his eardrum. And he had a stream of blood coming out. And our, we were shooting storm chasers at the time. And our camera guy was like, Mick, your ear's bleeding. And he's scanning radar. We're looking all around. The cinnamon bun was above us. And that was one of those dangerous situations where the tornado rapidly intensified with us in the dominator in the middle and it blew our window out on the left hand side because we we had these polycarbonate windows that we had to manually lift in place but we didn't have time to get them up so i had the windows down because we were intercepting some weaker tornadoes and i was looking up at the cinnamon bun and we rolled up the regular windows and a suction vortex came around the back side and blew the glass out and uh then just went off to the east so So, but if it was a little stronger, you know, it could have been bad. But I think if we had our polycarbonate windows up, the spikes deployed, we, we definitely would have been But even fine that, anyway, it's just so. a theory. Like, you, okay, like, okay, we've got this car. We'll put spikes on it. We'll reinforce the windows. <laughs> Should be good. But you're like, well, fuck it, let's see it. Well, if. Exactly. And it was actually built by a, uh, our golf course mechanic. <laughs> so I, I worked. I had a golf course growing up, you know, mowing yeah, grass, too. and uh, I was uh, I, I, it was great, one of my best jobs in my life, you know, mowing fairways. Yeah, I loved it. I worked in uh, Lubbock. I worked at a golf course. It's, I, I tell it all the time. Like, it's the best job you can get. Yeah, it is. I loved it. I, I would do it today, you know, if I wasn't so obsessed with storm chasing. You know, I would. that's probably what I would do for a living, I think, is – super uh, golf course if, maintenance. If anybody that follows you, and I do follow you a lot, I would be more worried about you running out of gas somewhere and getting sucked up by a tornado than anything <laughs> else because you're Mr. Live on the E all the time. Yeah, I do live on E. You know, sometimes I, I forget to pay attention to the gas and everything too. So I run out of gas probably 10 times yeah, a, a year. Lot of times. Even in fair weather, even oh. when I'm not storm chasing, I'll just run out of gas. <laughs> so you. But back yeah. to the golf course, that was a, our golf course mechanic built the Dominator. So. You know, it, I, the first vehicle I got at a bank was a 2008 Chevy Tahoe, and we instantly turned it into the Dominator 1. I didn't tell the bank <laughs> or the insurance company that we did that to it. And uh, our golf course me- uh, mechanic engineer, Kevin Barton, he's the one that built the Dominators. He's an absolute genius. I mean, he can build anything. And uh, he would build race cars for the dirt tracks up in Michigan. And, uh, you know, we would see Dominator 1 as it was coming together, and he was just welding, working on it nonstop, and he built it in like three months. And we went up there, and it just looked ready to intercept. So we piled in it, and bam, right out of the gate, we got an intercept on May 13, 2009 in Kirksville, Missouri, and it worked. But for some reason then, we didn't really think, you know, we were so optimistic. We never really thought, well, what if this thing mm-hmm. doesn't work? You know, we just assumed it would everything would work. Yeah, you trust the guy. You know, and you're kind of in that confident phase of your nah, life. You got you know? to trust your mechanic. They, if there's anybody you can trust, it's it's the it's a golf course mechanic that just made a tornado proof vehicle. What? Yeah, it's Kevin Barton. <laughs> what? Yeah. What's the scary? I know you've had to have an oh shit moment in your life, chasing. What? Yeah, the scariest one was uh, Canton, Texas, 2017. Uh, that big EF four there that caused a bunch of damage in Canton, and uh, but I just gone through my divorce, so I was you know taking some extra chances, trying to get like 50 feet from the tornado, trying to get you know a good shot. And uh, try to get back on track. And in Canton, Texas, I was right in the path of this massive wedge coming at me. And I should have done a three-point turn and got the vehicle ready to pull out. But I, I couldn't, you know, take my eyes off the tornado. And I waited till the very last second. And I had the armored Yukon back in the day. It has big tires and everything. But I just figured I'd drive through the ditch and get out. I didn't want to do the extra little stop, which I should have done a three-point stop. Because I went through the ditch and my traction control kicked in. Mm-hmm. And I slid down into the ditch, and next thing I know, I'm looking straight up at the edge of the tornado that was about to impact me. Trees started coming down. Power lines are exploding. And I thought to myself, this is it. You know, I have one shot here to try to get out of this ditch, and I'm going to try to run for my life. (laughs) And I just hit the gas pedal, and it was like, whoop, the car just lifted out onto the road. Like, And then I was facing southeast. The road was a southeast to northwest oriented road, and I was in the north side of the tornado. So... Uh, and I was not out of the woods yet once I popped out of the ditch because I was basically in the northern part of the tornado. Not necessarily the deadly part yet, but trees, power lines are going over my head. And I hit the gas pedal and I'm driving into the wind. 
and it was a four lane highway. I'm going like, oh, cross all four <laughs> lanes because the wind kept changing direction a little bit. But then I just a few seconds later, I looked back around and I can see the edge of the corner flow of the tornado, which is when the inflow goes up to the tornado and then shoots straight up at a 90 degree angle. I could see that it passed just behind me by like 50 feet, power explosions and everything. But that was probably the closest that I've ever come. And, you know, definitely took a little I kind of appreciated the little things for for a while after that. The big old dominator, the original one you had that looked like the fighter jet. I guess that was the original one. I don't know which one it was. But Dominator three, was. maybe. Um, how many times did you get that stuck? Oh man, maybe three was times. One, was one time well, in Southwest Oklahoma? Well, yeah, one time I was in Southwest yeah. Oklahoma. I saw yeah. y'all went. We did. We got stuck there. Another time in South Dakota. Yeah, y'all went down a road one time, and the guy next to me goes, "They're gonna have hell getting down that road and that thing." And we never saw you on the other side, so I figured y'all got stuck down there that day. But that th- that thing was a heavy yeah. vehicle. Was that? Are you sure that wasn't Plainview, Texas? I thought it was Southwest Oklahoma, but it may. It may. Yeah, we, I, I think I know we've been stuck in Southwest Oklahoma as well. But the Plainview, Texas day, two thousand nine, uh, April twenty nine, there were tornadoes all over the place. But we got stuck out there for you know the whole night. We spent the night <laughs> out there, and it was the worst road network I've ever seen. I mean, it was clay you know probably two feet deep if you tried to walk out of it it would be sticking all over your feet and everything and i don't know if you guys know jeff petrowski but he's one of the original storm chasers that was probably chasing in the late 70s as well and uh, he's still just as extreme these days you know at probably close to 60 years old but he was definitely kind of one of my the people that really inspired me to chase he was one of the original kind of up close kind of chaos chasers too and would get the crazy up close video never really use a tripod and uh he was out there that day and we were stuck in this dirt mud road with two huge ditches on either side and then i see this truck just plowing through the field like this mud field and he jumps the ditch i see the underside of the truck jumps over the road lands in the other side of the field and i saw it was jeff petrowski he had like a spotlight on his driver car had a headset on and like he was illuminated in the driver's seat, just flying through the air. And I, I mean, I'd never seen anything like it, you know. But it was just a beautiful thing seeing Jeff fly through the air like that, and then you know drive toward the tornado. What's the, <clears throat> what's the prettiest tornado that you've ever seen? And I know that might be kind of a goofy question, but like where you just sit back and you're just like, my goodness, like that is a, a work of art. Probably the Malvan, Kansas tornado, uh, June 12, two thousand four. It was just a bright white rope, and uh, you know it had these concentric rings, donuts going all the way up that were wrapping around the vortex because of the dramatic updraft inside would excite these little horizontal donut vortices around it. But the sun was behind us. It was a LP or low precipitation supercell, and just a bright white tornado. You'd almost have to wear sunglasses okay. to look at it. It was so bright, you know, like. A beacon, but un- unfortunately, it did some damage in Malvane. It was rated an F3, and uh, it hit a house, and it was uh, it was weird. It was almost like glitter, you know, being lit up by the sun behind us. And then you come up to the the house that was destroyed, and I believe it was the Landis family. Uh, they were in the basement, and uh, they had to climb out of the basement and survive the tornado. But sadly, their whole entire house was destroyed. So that's 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 an interesting thing that you brought up. So you know, you you're obsession is these magnificent things of destruction but and then at the same time like you're also at ground zero for you see the devastation that it causes uh to families all across the all across the nation that has to kind of be tough for you to juggle the two emotions of my goodness look at what we just witnessed and oh there are real world Mm. consequences to this yeah, and I think that that tornado is kind of the perfect example of the dichotomy that happens out there. The tornadoes can be these beautiful, organized feats of nature. You know, the funnel is so smooth, it's so large and rotating so rapidly and so organized, kind of the perfect balance of inflow and outflow, almost like a living, breathing organism. But then you see the damage that they leave behind, the dark side and the loss of life and property and you know, it just breaks your heart. Uh, you feel guilty for being right. excited for seeing the tornado, for making an accurate forecast and tracking it down. And, you know, you help out the best that you can. And, 
you know, you can justify that dichotomy by, you know, that storm chasers help out as well by calling in reports and warning people on the path of the tornado and increasing awareness and bridging the gap between the National Weather Service and news media and people in the path of the tornadoes. But, you know, there's no way around it. The damage that they leave behind is is sad and heartbreaking. And all you can do is drop the storm chase and help out anybody that is in need uh, the best that you can. And, uh, try to warn people in the path of the storms and keep doing research to try to better understand them. You know, I, and uh, warning lead times are definitely increasing dramatically because of the, you know, the, the the hard work of all the scientists that are out there. And there's so, so many new technologies and supercomputers and new high resolution models that are available now. So I think the warnings are getting better. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the dark side that the tornadoes leave behind is ever going to go away. But I think that we're getting better equipped so that people can take the necessary precautions and try to keep them and their family safe in the path of these tornadoes. And you know, with all the good forecasts we have and all the models and stuff, and we still have days that are a bust. Two, three years ago, (laughs) we had an extreme day. I can't remember what it, it was enhanced risk with the PDF, uh, PDS uh, watch and more and everything. And it was. Is that 2019? And it turned out, I got on a. Yeah, I got on a tornado right outside of Spur, Texas, and it was the only tornado of the yeah. day. And we thought, boy, this is going to be all day long, and that was it. Yeah, you're on that yes. Paducah area yes. storm, right? That Yeah, that was a beautiful tornado. And that same storm, I think it was that storm. It might have been another one, but the Mangum, that was Oklahoma a big one. tornado happened, too. Yeah, but we got stuck behind the, the long line of storm chasers that day, so we were way behind the tornado, and... We were trying to launch rockets into into tornadoes from Dominator 3. We have that big rocket launcher on the roof with the antenna, the joystick inside, so we can aim it and everything at the inflow notch of the tornado. But because of that one, we were too far behind it to to get to the tornado. We missed a lot of tornadoes that year, too, as we were trying to launch rockets. But finally, that day southwest of Kansas City, we were able to find ourselves in the inflow notch of a that big wedge. That tornado, that line of traffic had to be 10, 10 miles long. It was horrible. It was absolutely yeah. horrible. Did, did you yeah, make we it up were there, there too? on the tornado and got to the tornado right when it crossed the road? But you, it took for it took wow, forever. Wow, you were at the front yeah. of the line. I drive fast and I pass a lot of people. Wow. Yeah, I need to be riding with you. It no, I'd like, like to just go with you one time and just learn. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Or what? you can let me drive and you can do all your work and yeah, I'll just you drive. Just, you just point and drive. <laughs> Because because Jeff's good yeah, at like getting through cool. roadblocks and like because he's a judge in a small town so he's got that little trump card and I don't mean, have he, to don't he, have to tell people that he's got he's got all sorts of things he's like listen okay. <laughs> I'm a judge in a small town I'm going down this road and he just he just it's better that. to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission yeah. and them That's highway true. patrolmen they That's don't want to be out there during them storms and and them county sheriffs yeah they do. a lot of times i'll chase with them too so i you know law enforcement they double yes. as storm chasers a lot of times so i i meet up with them all the time out there and you know we'll kind of chase in a little convoy you know in the town so just here recently in mississippi we were waiting for that that storm that was coming up in newton and you know the chief of police was out there and like we we're all talking about, about all the previous storms and storm spotting and stuff so we definitely do work work closely well, you're together you're a celebrity every every small town in the world every small town rural area that's got anybody that chases storms knows who reed timmer is i, I mean i'm telling you oh. right now and they will talk also we saw reed timmer 70 miles down the road so what yeah that's, really i mean because if you're going to be around that means there's going to be a tornado close you torn you get on a tornado yeah. almost every day most people yeah, I miss. I've been missing a lot of them these last couple of years, but I think I'm starting to get get in my groove a little bit in 2022. But, but so. you're going to get on the storm, and people know that, and that's why so many people follow up on you yeah. because a lot of people don't realize you chase a lot. An amateur person like me, we don't see a tornado every time. If I see a tornado every three times I go, one out of three, it's been a good a, a good spring for me because you just don't see it. Yeah, and it. Yeah, and for me, I, since I chase everything, you know, I even chase the low end events as well. I mean, I, I I definitely chase too much, especially, you know, getting at my age, it's getting harder to grind out 100,000 miles a year, I guess. But I'm gonna start taking performance enhancers, sure? I think, here and everything. Uh, yeah, with medical advancements, you know, and all that, I, I'm hoping to chase for another 50 to 60 years or so. I think, Do you, you think know, that but, we'll ever get to a time where there's not some mystery surrounding these storms? Do you think technology is going to get to a point where it just kind of takes the uh, the mystique and mystery and anticipation out of it? 
I think so, and I think we're not that far away with this network of dual pull radars, and you know that you can track debris, and you know I think that you can identify a tornado almost before even a, you know, a, a even a meteorologist can, you know, automatically. And I think if you can have a, a denser network of radars, I know there was some talk years ago about mounting small scale radars on se- every cell phone tower. And I think if you have a dense network of radars where you can pinpoint exactly where the tornado is, then I think that there won't be that many surprises. But still, they happen fast. You know, they can, the storm goes from no tornado to tornado, you know, in a matter like that, you know, all, all the time. It's a really quick development of a tornado as well. I mean, usually you can see signs on radar, like the storm relative inflow starts to ramp up. and But sometimes, especially like with these QLCS tornadoes or nighttime tornadoes in a radar hole, you know, sometimes they can just still come out of nowhere a little bit but but yeah i think there were definitely there's definitely going to be a time period where the mystique will go away and you know there won't be any surprises and there'll probably be a fleet of drones that'll go out streaming live video and you know there may not be a need for the art form that is the up close extreme storm chaser anymore <laughs> that, uh, <clears throat> the yahoo that, chaser that kind of i mean it's, kinda, it's a little heartbreaking though in, in a way because it's just i don't know you know, there's something romantic about what you do and you, you put these models together and your forecast and then like everything, it's like, it literally is the perfect storm when a tornado drops. You're like, okay, everything I thought about this storm is happening right in front of me. And you know, if technology gets to the point where it's just, oh yeah, we knew that was going to happen. There still are surprises though. And you know, there's, it still takes you a while to get to drive, you know, mm-hmm. distance. And so you still don't know what the storm looks like, even though it has a debris indicator. And then when you come around the corner and you see the structure, you see the tornado, you know, you still get that uh, the butterflies in the stomach, you know, and you see what the storm looks like. And every storm has its unique personality, I think, as well. And there are new tornado alleys, too, like the Pampas down in Argentina, where we chased like 10 years ago. You know, that, that's kind of a, a newer, you know, storm chasing community down there. And uh, even South Africa, you could go and chase tornadoes. I did not know that. But China's getting all kinds of tornadoes. I did not know that. <laughs> when, in Argentina and Africa. When, when you chase, you also go to hurricanes. You go to everything. Blizzards, it don't matter what's going off, it's where they go. Yep. When you do hurricanes, do you plan on, do you take extra fuel and water and food with you? Because you can get stranded down there just in the storm surge or the tidal surge. Yeah, you can get you can get stranded down there for a long time, potentially days and even longer. So I always bring gas tanks and try to bring food, like a bunch of Vienna sausages, you, you know, that to kind of thing. Performance drugs if your diet, diet is Vienna sausages for an extended amount of time. Yeah, my diet's not great <laughs> overall. I mean, I eat a lot of fast food and gas station burritos, so yeah. it's not great. And her- I got to Need to start eating more fiber, I think. All sips burritos. And hurricane season is followed by being hot and humid when the electricity's off wherever you're at mm-hmm. down there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hurricane and hurricane season has been really active these last couple of years, all the way back to 2017. Really, uh, has been really active with Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, and then the legendary 2020 season with Louisiana getting hit by all those hurricanes. And inside hurricanes, there are tornadoes too, so you get a lot of tornado warnings, and you'll see tornadoes in the outer bands of hurricanes. And then you got to handle the storm surge because we're deploying all those sensors along the coast to measure the storm surge and stream that data back live. So the storm surge is probably the most scary part of of, of chasing hurricanes because it's just like a tsunami-like wall of water that comes in right in the eye wall of the hurricane. There's winds gusting to 200 miles an hour, and then this wall of water comes in that has debris, and it's probably the most deadly feature that, that you could chase, I would think, just because the, the power of water is so strong. Is this strong. podcast coming out Monday? Uh, I don't, it can come out whenever, Monday or Tuesday. Okay, let's say this. We're, let's do it Monday. Okay. You, you, you said Severe weather. Okay. Yeah. Three days out, it's Friday right now, Friday afternoon, three days out, and you told me earlier, Monday, we're going to have a chance of tornadoes in North Texas. Yeah, yeah, it looks like there's a chance of tornadoes, at least big hail, but you remember that event last year out near Lockett, Texas, that looked like just primarily a big hail day as well, and it was, you know, tornadoes all over the place. The tornado of the year happened in Lockett and everything, so it kind of reminds me a little bit of that one. It's a subtle trough. A lot of directional shear. Probably going to be some big hail as well. You know, a good day to blow the window yeah, I've out. I've done that before. That's you fun. Know, it's some hail <laughs> it is. Yeah, I love hail. Hail is one of my favorite things to chase too. And and also flash floods. I've gotten into flash floods from my friend David Rankin, who grew up in Big Water, Utah. Grew up chasing those debris flows during monsoon season. 
And so he you know, taught me his craft out there. And I love chasing those debris flows and flash floods as well, where you kind of combine your knowledge of the, you know, where the, the water would go, topography, the hourly rainfall. And you have to think like a fluid when you're chasing those flash floods too and use your drone to intercept them. And if they're moving slow enough, you can actually run along <laughs> the front edge of the debris. Flow too. I saw your videos on you doing okay. that last year. So that's your new thing now is to chase the floods? Yeah, I've been doing it since about 2016. So that was when, you know, I met David and, uh, you know, and he taught me his craft. So he's a genius when it comes to, he developed a forecast model that takes into account hourly rainfall and the where the creeks and washes go and predicts the timing of these potentially deadly flash floods that go into slot canyons and everything. And And then he built a telescope, his own telescope, and he works at a laboratory hunting asteroids that are potentially heading toward earth so he's like an absolute genius just looking for dangerous rocks well, out i hope there. we don't succeed in finding one that's going to hit us well it's crazy i was listening to i was i can't remember who it was but any, the amount of asteroids that go by the earth in a given year that are considered near misses it's a lot it would freak them it would freak most yeah. people out if they knew how many yeah yeah there's a lot the near mi- miss is like ten thousand miles though isn't it well yeah but i mean it's it's, yeah, it's, it's a long <laughs> way, but it's it's close in the grand scheme of space. Um, yeah. So how did you get to where you are now? Were you an early adopter of, like, social media and kind of the, the social media meteorologist? Or what was the moment that uh, sent you on this trajectory? Well, it was probably – the May third, May third, ninety nine tornado. Honestly, that F five when we found ourselves underneath an overpass and we almost got hit by the tornado, covered in mud and everything. And you know, I, I think I was hooked at being up close to tornadoes really ever since that day and kind of seeing the power of the tornado firsthand. And sadly, that was also the first time that we saw the damage that they leave behind. What day was and, that? You know, so May third, May third, nineteen ninety nine. That, that was in that was in Kansas. No, that was in Oklahoma. That was the the big F five that came up from Bridge Creek and then South Oklahoma oh, okay, City yes, and more. Yes, I remember that that one. Okay. Yeah, I was a fresh I was a freshman at the University of Oklahoma, and we we shot video with five of us packed in a soft top geo tracker, mm-hmm. because we weren't allowed to have a vehicle down freshman year at, at OU, except one of our friends Matt Sanis had one of those old school geo trackers, one of those badass ones with the soft top, and we all packed in there and chase that that storm you know and it was really educational because the the tornado honestly was structurally perfect it had a clear slot you know the, and still to this day i remember it as the most textbook tornadic supercell structure i've ever seen but also very ominous because it had that massive cylinder above it and then went into a wedge you know below you could just feel the power even from long distance from that tornado and uh but yeah we were underneath the overpass shot that video and you know, then went and into the damage, and there were horses uh, walking across the highway, people emerging from their homes, and natural gas leaks. And, you know, we were what, 18 at the time, and, you know, it, it was definitely a, a crazy event. And uh, late that night, finally, after we got out of the damage, and uh, this is probably, you know, maybe 11 p.m., maybe midnight or so, we dropped it off at one of the news stations in Oklahoma City. And we dropped it off there, the video. And by the time I got to my dorm room, there were all these answering machine messages left on my phone. So it was, bef- you know, it was before we had cell phones. And so that kind of got me set on the trajectory of, I think I sold the video for like 300 bucks. And I, I was like, wow, I don't have to work at the golf course. You know, I could just shoot these videos of the tornado and, you know, I could do what I, lo- do what I love, even though I loved working at the golf course too, and still did, you know, worked for a couple of years after that. But I think that kind of got me on the trajectory of, shooting content of tornadoes even though i loved storm chasing and but i went to grad school you know i wanted to go the the research route as well but i think as i was storm chasing and then you know the viral videos were getting up there kind of you know looking a little bit extreme you know it became more and more difficult for me to you know pursue a career in academia and kind of had to go full throttle on the extreme storm chasing and storm chasers happened and i started a website and we were selling DVDs nonstop. I would ship out DVDs every day. And I was one of the early adopters of social media, too. In 2006, I just unloaded my whole entire library on YouTube and Facebook and all the social media platforms. And uh, that definitely helped out to kind of get started early. And I was making ad revenue on all those. And 
and that's kind of made it barely sustainable. But, you know, I've hit zero, you know, throughout my life many times, you know, as recently as 2017 out in Las Vegas. <laughs> but, you know, I've definitely, it's a, but uh, you know, I, I think it's definitely kind of a high variance living and but things are going good recently because of social media, I think, kind of has made it possible for content creators to monetize their content a lot more. And I've worked with AccuWeather as well. And uh, that, that was, that, that's that been a, a really good partnership uh, doing weather reports with media. And uh, we're, the whole goal is to try to fund our science, which is launching sensors into tornadoes and measuring data and writing papers and that. But I'm driving so much, you know, that I've kind of burned out all these years. So it's hard to hard to, to write papers too, and we're storm chasing nonstop. But finally, with that rocket launch, we collected some data, I think that is going to be you know, really interesting. And we're, we're finished with our paper, and we're going to publish that. And uh, that's, you know, really what it's all about, I think, is doing what you love, and then, you know, trying to launch things into tornadoes, whether you're throwing rocks into it, or shooting a rocket, you know, as long as you you know, get the object into the tornado. That's kind Isn't of the goal. Isn't there a video from back in your day when y'all were on the Kansas Turnpike at Greensburg, maybe? Or, or, and uh, uh, you, you you help the people up under the bridge and the damn winds going on and the tornado. It's amazing how bad the wind is. Was that is that your video? It's on the Turnpike, and there's three trucks that get blown over. That, yeah. That's not – I don't think that's our video. I think that's the Andover, yes, that's Kansas it. It's the Andover, tornado. yes. Yeah, unfortunately, I was a little bit too young to chase that event, but you know that was a big outbreak in the early '90s, and uh, that was a news crew that was in the in the path of that dangerous tornado that uh, you know, coming right up the Kansas Turnpike. Uh, but yeah, that wasn't me. But I I was with a, involved in a different overpass incident. So, but research came out later that it's actually more dangerous to seek shelter underneath an overpass because it can actually act as a wind tunnel and accelerate the wind. Oh, it was terrible. That, that 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 footage shows how bad the wind is. That guy grabs that little girl and they put her up under the deal. But you know, in Wichita Falls, more people got killed at the clinic in Wichita Falls. There's an overpass. And I think there was 11 or 15 people that were killed right there because that's when I was growing yeah. up as a kid, that's what that's you were what always told said. to do. Go, to go lay overpass. down in a, bit, a ditch or lay under an overpass. <clears throat> well, that tornado <clears throat> hit that, that bridge fr from the side and it just sucked everybody right out from under it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it can act as a wind tunnel, but I still think if there's like a, you know, a little notch or something up there, you'd probably be safer wedging yourself in that than just standing out in the open, right. you know, and just taking that's the tornado or you know it might be safer i think it's still safer to be in your car in a ditch than even just you know outside of the car than in a ditch but because the vehicle is designed to go down the road you know potentially at speeds up to 100 miles an hour without right. flying through the air so it can handle a vehicle relative wind down its main axis at least but the debris is what's dangerous the windows will get blown out but i feel like if you can bury your car in a ditch if there's no other escape route you know i always would tell my mom or my you know, my loved ones, my friends, you know, if they're in the path of a tornado, sometimes I'll even tell them to drive, you know, 20 miles in a different direction to get out of its path or something. But of course, you can't recommend that, you know, universally because there'll be traffic jams. People drive into the tornado and it's just safer to, you know, shelter, you know, have a tornado shelter, of course, is the safest, you know, below ground tornado shelter, or above ground tornado shelter, of course. But a mobile home is the worst place, about the worst place to be, you know, in the path of a tornado. I don't imagine your house probably has a cellar, does it? I mean, you're you're not even going to be home to enjoy it. You're not even going to be there. Yeah, when I had a house, it certainly didn't have a cellar, you know, or shelter. And I don't have a house now, but uh, I'm actually at my mom's place here that in South Carolina because it's within range of Mississippi and Alabama. I've got an apartment you know, in Colorado, so I can work the Northern Plains. I can get up to South Dakota, Canadian prairies. But I'm thinking about moving back to Oklahoma, uh, maybe this this summer as well. But yeah, my house didn't have a, a shelter, but it did get hit by a tornado in 2015. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I was on a different storm too. I was working for Channel Four, and I was on a storm in Enid, Oklahoma, and my house ended up getting hit by an EF2. And Gizmo, my storm chasing dog, was in there. Hmm. Oh, no. in the house you know and the dominator was parked in the driveway but <laughs> there's some irony for you, you they, know? Were, they were yeah. they were talking a lot about it on the radio that day you know uh, <laughs> didn't even have to leave his front yard people in oklahoma have the best storm the, the oklahoma city metro area mm -hmm. damon lane and them you can get on the radio or, or you can listen that's what's good about chasing in oklahoma for an amateur you can turn on the radio and you can get the news 
on the radio, and they give live play-by-play of the places to be. And there's no mm-hmm. other town in the world has the radio, the weather. Wichita, Kansas might. I don't know. But I know that Oklahoma City has got as good a weather as there is for, t- for t- tornado watching. Yeah, they definitely do. I mean, their whole local media market kind of revolves around weather, and they all have different storm chasing teams that have tricked out vehicles. There's Channel 4, Channel 9, and Channel 5 up there. And it's almost like a real time, you know, entertainment for the people. They're tuning in, they're, they got the helicopter in the air, they go to the ground, people on the ground. At the same time, they're warning people in the path of the storms as well. So, you know, everybody's watching it, and they're great at breaking down radar identifying storm structure, the best storm chasers in the world, the best, you know, severe weather meteorologist as well with uh, Mike Morgan. And, uh, you know, it used to be Rick Mitchell at Channel 5. Now it's Damon Lane there. Channel 9 is uh, David Payne. It used to be Gary England back in the day. But, yeah, severe weather and local media in Oklahoma definitely go hand in hand. I'm going to tell you what, Damon Lane went from Abilene, Texas to Oklahoma City. He got a big bump in getting the excitement in his life, I can tell you that much. <laughs> we get tornadoes out here, Joe. <laughs> Not like you do in Oklahoma. It, but what I is did, it about Oklahoma? Why is that the why is that the place? Well, I think you get just just as many in northwest Texas, you know, in, in my opinion. But it does seem like recently the I-44 corridor, basically from the Lawton area up to Oklahoma City, even northeast of there, has been a hot spot. But Dixie Alley, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, I pretty much live down here this time of year until a little bit later in the spring. Then I'm back in Norman. And then I, I'm a high plains drifter in the midsummer, so I like chasing the big high plains supercells with massive hail and the due easterlies up to about two kilometers. Mm. So then the Canadian prairies after that, and then the corn belt season, and then hurricane season and flash flooding, you know, monsoon season as well. So it's it's year round if you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought? So, I mean, if you'd have told your high school uh, counselor, this is what I'm going to do. They, I did, yeah. <laughs> what what did they say? They're like, they, yeah, right. You're gonna be, you're gonna end up working at the golf course. Yeah, they they supported it though a little bit because Twister came out at like the same time. Oh, so you had so that, that going for you. That certainly helped, you know. Right. Yeah, that. But then it was also kind of going against us because then you got to the University of Oklahoma, and I think a lot of people were kind of overwhelmed by the influx of students that were coming into meteorology programs. So we had like two to 300 students at OU during my freshman class. And when we graduated, we had like 20 because you realize that it's all just math derivations and equations and stuff. Yeah, it's not near as sexy as what you thought it would be whenever you watch Twister and, you know, you're belting yourself to that wellhead. So the F5 would take you over. Yeah, so a lot of people would drop out and everything, you know. But but I was an old science Olympian. I mean, I was there for the science and to memorize everything and, you know, uh, memorize all the equations and everything and i ended up going to school for 17 straight years continuously enrolled from 98 <laughs> to 2015 so that's got to be a record somewhere oh definitely yeah i mean nobody's even probably done half of that i would think at uh, oklahoma but i was storm chasing a lot you know and I, I wish i got out a little faster you know it definitely started to drag on at the end but Nah, it's no big deal. Now, I want to go back a little bit because you said you were you got too close to a tornado. You were going through your divorce. Did were, were, what what did that have to do with uh, with your mentality? Were you just kind of in a funk and you 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 were pushing it a little bit or what did you yeah. what did you mean by that? Yeah, I was definitely pushing it a little bit. You know, I was trying to get a little closer to the tornado and uh you know, I was trying to work hard. I was trying to kind of get my career back on track, you know, as well and uh you know, I definitely had a little bit, you know, of that mentality to try to get a little closer to the tornadoes for sure. I still have it a little bit now. So I think it's, you know, but yeah, definitely that 2017 year, I was pretty motivated to get a little closer to the tornado. Have you been motivated by Chevy to go roll your car through a tornado and get a free truck like that kid did? <laughs> I'm afraid. That yeah, I saw that. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I'm afraid of the precedent that's going to set. I'm Because now yeah, you're going to have I'm, every 17 year old trying to do that my truck looks like that now from chasing it's got more hell dents than a big girl's butt does and <laughs> i mean i'm gonna try to do it again i try to get as close as i can all the time anyways but if there's a new truck mm-hmm. on the line i'm just worried about the precedent that's going to set to youngsters yeah i can see that too you know but it's also really hard to get inside of a tornado i mean i try to and it's <laughs> hard for me so it's got to cross the road right in front of you and you know, when you're a half mile from the tornado, it looks like you're about 100 yards from it. So, you know, when you're really close to the, when you're a half mile away, you're 
it looks like you're right next to it. So you still got to drive another five minutes full throttle to get into the tornado. And it's really hard with that voice in the back of your head telling you to go the other direction. And it looks crazy when it's rotating right in front of you. And one side of the tornado, the wind is all coming toward you. So it's kind of an optical illusion where it looks like the tornado is coming right at you. But it's really difficult to get inside of a tornado. So realizing that I'm not as concerned, but that was one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, if they're getting a free truck for getting inside of a tornado, then, you know, then or is that going to set a precedent and are people going to try to do it? But yeah, I'm gonna call Elon there's Musk. no guarantee that, that they're going to give a free truck every time though. It might just be kind of a one-time thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it happened. I mean, not to get too so out of left field, but when uh team mom came on uh, MTV, teen mom mm-hmm. aired on MTV there were teenagers in high school that were getting pregnant so that they could be on Teen Mom. And it's like, listen, <laughs> just that, because yeah. you're 16 and pregnant does not mean you're going on MTV. So, like, just pump the brakes. But, yeah, yeah. teen and pregnancy skyrocketed. Not a, good, not a good move. It's not a good career move. So, I mean, it's just kids are stupid. Okay. That's I'm, what it boils down to. I'm going to ask you as a, as a forecaster, <clears throat> mm-hmm. do you feel worse? Now, because – I in our little town, people come to me for for the weather. I give updates on if we got hail coming. I try my best to do it, and mm-hmm. all I'm doing is taking stuff from you and everybody else and, and and cheating and trying. But I try to help people Plagiarism. out. If we got if we got yeah. hail coming 15 miles away, I tell people. And it's funny. I catch more shit when it doesn't hit than I do when it does, and I get it right. I get people all the time. Well, you said it was going to hail here, and we didn't get any hail, and I went outside, and moved my truck inside. All I'm yeah. trying to do is help you. Do you get more grief when you're wrong on a forecast or people that uh, are pissed when you get it right and you try to tell them? Because you get people that get mad when you say it's going to do something. I don't want to hear that. Well, yeah, I, I honestly don't have people that get too mad about that. But I do see it a lot online when people, you know, they get a lot more upset at an inaccurate forecast than they reward on the other side for an accurate forecast. But you know, I definitely do get a little bit of negative energy, you know, as well, more than positive probably, or maybe about 50-50. I'm kind of kind of used to having kind of a polarizing effect, I think, when you're up close to the tornado. And, I'm, you know, I get kind of loud, you know, and obnoxious when I'm close to it, too. I don't even remember it either. Like, in my in my mind, I'm just sitting there stone cold silent, and then I watch the video, and I'm like, holy cow, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> but people get so upset when you try to tell them, you know, hey, we got – 15 miles south of Knox City, it's moving mm-hmm. north, and it's got and, they do. and it's got golf ball size hail. And he you hears tell them it from that, me. and then yeah. and then Andy will call me. Well, it didn't even rain here. Well, move I can't my, help move my fucking pickup. I, I got wet. I move my pickup because you said it's gonna hail. It didn't even do anything. So this is where it's yeah, it's where it's coming. But yeah, I definitely get that too. But I think that you, it's your your duty, you know, to tell people when there's hail coming and when you have that knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, that you know there's a hailer out there, and if you think it's gonna hit somewhere. You know, you have to tell them what you think, you know, especially since you know that the hails, you're following the radar and everything. But, yeah, I think it's normal for humans to focus on an inaccurate forecast more than an accurate one. What you know, most. I, I definitely I'm glad that. I'm not a TV meteorologist or National Weather Service because I know they get a lot of heat for, you know, bad forecasts of snow and you know temperature and things like that. I just forecast whether all hell's going to break loose or not. So, it's <laughs> you know, if it doesn't happen, then people are pretty happy anyway. Yeah. So they're not, you know, not mad at me. I tell you, it's it's just crazy the way people get worked up over stuff. And what really, what really what drives me crazy is people that can't look at a freaking radar. Yeah. How, how yeah. hard is it? Every phone's got a radar. People, oh, dude, there's storms coming. Well, yeah, that's what that big red and yellow thing is at Southwest moving this way. That's a storm. And people just yeah. amaze me. What do you think it's going to hit us? What's well, moving right to us? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I think in reading a map and knowing where they are relative to the storm and everything too, I think that. You know, that that skill should be definitely taught from a young age, How to, especially with the, the advent of radars, weather apps and everything. You can if you can learn how to read the storm, read a map, read your location relative to the storm, then it, it's it's pretty trivial to stay away from the dangerous conditions. So let me ask you this. Is every storm. Are there universal truths in every storm like you can pretty well predict how it's going to act or is every storm just its own unique entity well with uh with tornadoes i think we have a pretty deep understanding of the wind shear profiles that need to come together to result in a tornado threat like you need a lot of low-level wind shear uh, strengthening low-level jet you need access to surface space instability temperature and moisture 
And so I, I think that given the kind of the understanding of the environmental conditions that come together for tornadoes, if a storm moves into that environment, you definitely have expectations for it because you've seen what plays out so many times in the past when a similar storm is moving into a, an environment that's supportive of tornadoes. So a lot of times there's not any surprises when it, when it happens anymore, just because we have such an understanding of the wind shear and everything. But, you know, there are definitely s- surprises and in- intermixed throughout on different time scales as well. Like the hail a lot of times is a lot bigger than you might think, or the tornado's larger than you thought, or, you know, there, a, a big time tornado can happen in a marginal environment, mm-hmm. you know, or for flash floods, especially there's a lot of mystery. So, yeah, you know, there's still a lot of that. You hear Gizmo barking downstairs. Yeah, he's, he's ready to go. He's ready to, he's ready to catch something. Um, yeah, she's ready. So, one thing that I was going to ask you is, um, how do you, how did you turn off that inner voice inside your head to like, okay, I've got to go. Cause you, like you said, it looks like it's a hundred yards away. It's actually a half mile. When did, or do you still have that voice? And you just like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going forward. Yeah. I still have that voice, but I just block it out. You know, if I'm trying to get really close to the tornado, but maybe honestly now I don't really have that voice as much and I, I just try to get as close as I can every time, which, yeah. you know, sometimes I got to kind of take a step back and be like, you know, you're not in an armored vehicle anymore. You know, you're in a beat up Subaru. <laughs> you know, maybe let's not drive into this one, you know, or get stop a little short of it, you know? Yeah. You definitely kind of have to adjust your mindset, but you know, I, I don't think, yeah, I, I, I definitely haven't changed my storm chasing strategy too much since the, time of the armored vehicle so, so what is what's your long-term forecast for the next two months busy tornado think, season or slow i think it's going to be a busy tornado season and march has already been busy i think in terms of the p- preliminary severe weather reports it's been more active than any march in history so far so they still have to verify and finalize all those reports but the, even that's not a surprise because of the similarities with 2011 being a year two la nina and a warm North Pacific oscillation event with that warm blob in the North Central Pacific, the cold water that wraps around the eastern periphery of the Pacific Basin on the northeastern side up to the Gulf of Alaska. I think that that pattern is kind of uniquely favorable for tornadoes, especially when you have a warm Gulf of Mexico in an area of high pressure off the southeastern U.S. And that's what led to 2011 April being the most active April in recorded history with over 700 tornadoes. So there are a lot of similarities with 2011 to this year, except that the severe weather is starting a lot earlier. It's already gotten started in uh, March being really active when in 2011 it didn't get going until April. So I think April is going to be active probably through late April. And then I think there's a chance that the severe weather season could just abruptly shut off and suddenly a, a mega drought could build That's in. what we don't need is 2011 drought. When you kept saying 2011, that's all I could hear. We need a bad tornado season in, in we western Oklahoma because we, we need the rain. rain. We need the rain is what we need. So you think in May, yeah. it's, when it shuts off, you think it's going to shut off for a while? Yeah, and I'm concerned that there's going to be really fast-moving, strong dry lines that are going to push pretty far east of the plains. I mean, we, are, we already had that, those tornadoes near I-35 down near Austin. You know, which is a pretty far east, rapidly moving dry line. And you'll get a storm chase in Texas, then you get one in Alabama, then you get one in North Carolina, then you got to drive all the way back in Texas, <laughs> Mississippi, Alabama, and drive all the way back. And you do that like 10 times, probably through April. And I, I should do it on Sunday, but, you know, I think I'm going to fly out there and might rent a car and blow the windows out, you know, <laughs> northwest of Dallas. So, are you, is it, does it just, wear on you the all the miles that you have to put on because i mean i drove we drove we went skiing and it's seven hours and by the time i got there my ass was hurting my back was aching i couldn't imagine yeah, driving from mississippi does. to texas to west texas and then back again yeah and i drive about a hundred thousand miles probably too and i've been doing it you know for at least the last six seven years i've been chasing everything just driving all over the country living out of hotels you know as i've been working for accuweather and you know, full, basically a full dedication to chasing tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, and, and pretty much everything. So that's definitely been wearing on me a little bit. But I, I started running at the same time, too. So I'll, like, pull over and then try to run, you know, 8, 10 miles or so. And I started getting addicted to it. So I, I, I try to run as much as I can so I don't get blood clots or anything like that. And so I, I think that's really the only only uh and i use natural medicine you know to to sleep well at night and stuff you know and just try to 
do a lot of cardio and natural med- sleeping medicine. I've never had the runner's high. Have you? Is that is it bullshit or do you do you finally no, reach I a peak? Do. Yeah, it's it's real. And it, it took me a while to get there, but then once it happened, it it was amazing. Like the colors get all bright, you know, bright blue sky. You start looking at the flowers and the bright leaves on the trees and start appreciating nature more. And like, it's like you really absorb your surroundings a lot more too. So what, I was definitely feeling it. What is it? Is it, uh, is it just the chemicals in your brain or is it just like you've, you fucking exhausted yourself and now you're like, Oh yeah, that tree is over there and it is beautiful. I think it pumps endorphins in there and also energizes the nervous system. So like you just kind of get like hyper aware too. Yeah. How far do you have to go before you achieve that? Uh, for me, like usually by about the third mile, like by the mile three or so, I start feeling it. And then it carry. How long does it carry? Does it stop once you stop running, or does it carry on for a couple hours? No, it carries on afterward. Really. And then you get re- kind of really hungry too, and then your food tastes better. And then I can sleep at night because I think with all the adrenaline rushes that I've had over like twenty five years, it like made my adrenal glands really sensitive. Right. So I drink a cup of coffee and I just get all fired up. Really? So I, can, I have to like run like this and then I can sleep better at, at night, you know, and try to get a lot of sleep still. See, that's interesting but, to me because I would think with all the adrenaline that your body has taken in that you would almost get dull to it. You would get numb yeah, to it. Yeah, you'd think that, but it it's seems opposite. to have the opposite effect. So I'm like getting more excited now when I see a tornado, it seems like. That's interesting. Yeah, you would figure yeah. just like, oh, you've seen one, you've seen them all, but it's the opposite on you. You get more worked up. Yeah, I think it makes them hypersensitive, huh. you know. So. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, that's a weird deal. Have you seen, in your estimation, have you seen more tornadoes than anybody else on, on this planet? Yes. I think so, but, you know, I, I kind of lost count, too. So I'm not, I haven't been keeping a tally, and, like, a lot of times I don't count. I probably could go back and count. I think I'm somewhere near 700 tornadoes or so, but I think Roger Hill uh, up in Colorado has seen i think he's a, he keeps tally keeps count of every tornado you know and i think he submitted his count to the guinness book of world records and everything too but i, I think he's pretty close as well but you know i'll be chasing for a long time i right. think and i chase everything too so yeah how many you know. um did, and he did he chase hurricanes i don't know anything about him so i mean you i don't think he chases hurricanes your count well. probably got bumped up just a little bit because you see tornadoes <laughs> and hurricanes yeah, I think I've probably seen like 40 or 45 or so tropical cyclones, you know, like tropical storms, mm-hmm. uh, you know, hurricanes as well. And uh, I haven't been out to Asia yet to chase a typhoon. I, we were meaning to do that for that show Storm Rising on National Geographic, but then the pandemic hit and we had to focus everything here in the U.S. And But that was going to be our opportunity to go out to the Philippines and chase one of those super typhoons. I tell you, one of the coolest things I ever saw was a uh, water spout. Oh wow! Yeah, that would be awesome. We saw that. I've seen it. Yeah, that would be. Where'd you see it? W- what's that place we stayed at? St. George Island. Oh and yeah. It, why, oh, it, Florida. Yeah, come on. Florida. It hit a couple yeah. of houses and stuff, but that's the only time I've ever seen one. We were in Cancun one year, and they saw them. And I had just left and, and went up to the hi- to the room, and I missed that. I... How do you um, how do you deal with like a normal day when there's not like just this? fast motion and and you know i run a lot you know and uh i golf quite a bit and i mountain bike you know i I like to ski as well so i love nature so we've been digging for crystals a lot here recently with yeah that's that's a lot of fun that's a good change of pace just digging for rocks you know and yeah getting in the mud after the torn after you know the storm dies down do you go through like a de-escalation period like to where you just kind of decompress yeah, yeah, I'm kind of in that right now, actually, because I just got I got back last night from the the chase there in Louisiana, Mississippi, and stuff. So there definitely is a lag. There's like cortisol buildup and stuff. I'm all sore, mm-hmm. you know. I just I just ran a little bit, so I'm kind of trying to work out all the bad bad vibes, you know. And then I got to head back west on Sunday for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. Looks active. Yeah. It's going to be another Texas, Mississippi, then Alabama event. And then the long range too. the middle of April looks really active. We, uh, we have a guy that hunts with us and he was, uh, a bomb disposal guy. He was a bomb disposal guy. He's a Navy seal. And he said, uh, when it came time to defuse the bomb, 
locked in, laser focused, like nothing would shake him. But when he got home and it all just kind of came, he was coming down, that's when he would start shaking and his heart would start racing and he had a lot of issues after. It wasn't before. It was just, this is my job. This is what I got to do. And I know what I have to do. But it was sitting down, cracking a beer, watching TV. He was like, oh, shit, I'm about to have a heart attack. Yeah, I guess some of those a little bit too, but I think my excitement too is so, such a positive one when I'm around the tornado a little bit, but it still has a negative impact on you physiologically, whether it's a positive or neutral or negative excitement. I think adrenaline still kind of takes a little bit of a toll, but you know, it just I think it's just doing the exercise is is really the only way to to combat it. You know, yeah, it's crazy. C- CBD treatment. You know, I'm a big big believer in the natural medicines. Do you drink uh, Kill Cliff? <laughs> I drink Kill Cliff CBD drink. It's fan- it's it's wonderful. I'll check it out definitely. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. It's got a CBD drink, and uh, I've I've had a lot of like joint pain. I'm 34, so yeah. I've worked out my entire oh. life. So you know, I got joint pain and back pain, and it's great. Do you? Uh, yeah, are, that's what I eat, so I think it helps a lot. Have you been surprised at the number of winter tornadoes we've had the last couple of years? Like hit Dallas on Christmas Day and all that stuff last couple of years. And do you chase a lot of those days, or these just all spring up real fast? No, I chased those. I chased December 10 and 11, the long track EF4 tornadoes, when there was a big debate as to whether it was a quad state tornado or not. So, you know, I chased all of those. And I definitely wasn't surprised that it was going to be active. I, I didn't think it would be active right during the heart of winter, like in December. You know, I thought maybe January, February, there'd be some events. But I knew the favorable conditions in the climate system in the Pacific and the warm Gulf of Mexico and that persistent high pressure that's been off the southeastern U.S., so I figured there'd be some big days, but I didn't think it would be record breaking like it was on December 15 and December 10 and 11. And, you know, during the fall, I thought it'd be an active fall season, which it was. Yeah. Uh, and then the active spring. But, you know, sometimes I, I've noticed that I just always think it's going to be active as well Gla- <laughs> every year. Glass half full type of guy. What's the what's the biggest tornado on record? Was it the Moore tornado or is there another? Well, the biggest one was actually the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado. Okay. So that was in 2013, and uh, that one was, what, 2.5, 2.6 miles wide. So, you know, that that's the widest one. And then the second most is the Hallam, Nebraska tornado in 2004. And I also saw that one. That one was right near sunset at uh, just under 2.5 miles wide. I think it was 2.2. But that's really wide. When you're close to a tornado, that just looks like a wall, you know, pretty much just a dark Right. wall right in front of you see that's what the wichita falls tornado looked like when i was a kid it looked like just a big rain shaft yeah when you're that close to a wedge that's what it looks like and there was another ef5 on may 24 2011 that went through piedmont uh up through you know central oklahoma area that was an ef5 el reno i think was also hit by that one uh but that tornado was also similarly large over a mile mile and a half i believe at times and we were shooting storm chasers then and we had already intercepted a couple tornadoes, including one that caused a tsunami on Canton Lake up there. And we were dropping south and had to use the restroom. So we're all lined up along a barbed wire fence taking a leak. And we look up and there's just this dark wall that looked like a rain shaft. And then suddenly you saw a piece of sheet metal go by and another piece of debris. And we're like, we got to go. <laughs> and everybody zips up, you know, and gets in our car. And we barely got out of there. We almost got hit by it. Now, you said... Uh the bigger the tornado, they make a different sound at kind of a different frequency. So you can, at night, you can kind of gauge how big a tornado is, uh, even though you can't see it. Yeah. And if it's a strong tornado, a strong to violent tornado, it makes a very distinct roar, like a really low frequency roar that almost rumbles the ground and sounds kind of more like a waterfall than a jet engine, I would say. But there is a little bit of jet engine in there too, especially with the, the really compact tornadoes like the stovepipe ones that are really skinny and just really ripping in there. Mm-hmm. Those ones have a really distinct, almost like a higher pitched roar, like a waterfall type roar. And that's what the Crockett, Texas one sounded like just the other night. It was kind of one of those really compact stovepipes that was really erratic too. It would go back and forth across the road and then it would widen out to a wedge, get skinny again. And it was just one of those really erratic powerful tornadoes that tornado sound i'm telling you when i was a kid that one in wichita i've never forgot that sound like a it's like a train was fixing to come through the house 
Yeah. And, just, yeah. It, it, and then I was, you know, it. yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's really distinctive, isn't it? Yeah. You, you'll never, I mean, when you hear it, you'll know it again. I've never, I've never been that close to a tornado. Don't that, plan to be. So that was a scary good. deal. Cause when I'm out chasing, I'll just I'm not, watch well, Reed's uh, Instagram and I'll well, be fine. When I'm out chasing, I don't get scared cause I'm out in it and stuff. But when I was a kid sitting in that, in that closet and your house was shaking and stuff and that sound is something you'll never forget as a kid. I mean, I, every detail and everybody that was, that's ever been in a big tornado or a tornado all they can tell you everything that happened in that moment but yeah you remember like it was yesterday yeah, it, it was a very helpless feeling but chasing doesn't because i can get out and get away i feel like i got freedom you know mm-hmm. you don't you don't worry that much about it and so i'd much rather be out in a, than sitting in a house waiting for it to hit me yeah i mean it, it, you feel free like a bird out there when you're driving down the road and you feel in control the storm is right there. It's kind of doing what you'd expect. You can see all the meteorology start playing out in front of you. And it's definitely a, you know, you definitely feel very free out there when you're driving in your car. Yeah. What's Reed Timmer's plans in the future? What do, what do you got next? I mean, you're a flex seal guy now. Yeah. And it yeah, does work. Right. Evidently, according to your uh, vehicle, you got it all taped up and. Yeah, it does work. My, my whole vehicle is pretty much covered in it now, and I mount GoPro mounts on it and everything and holds my mirror together <laughs> on the side. And I, was at, I was using it naturally even before, and they reached out on social media. I was waterproofing my car, you know, and the windows would blow out. I'd just layer it with flex tape, and it'd just be vibrating back there. So, I mean, that's, that's a hell of a commercial, though, because, like, you're in some of the worst weather that you could imagine, and you put flex seal over it, and you stay dry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we mount our sensors inside hurricanes, in, in front of hurricane storm surges as well, and it survives all of those. And we deployed them on the bomb cyclone out in Cape Cod, and I'm trying to deploy them in the path of these tornadoes, but I keep you know, just barely missing the tornado. Like out in Crockett, we missed it by 100 yards or so. Just a couple of days ago, I missed it you know, by a quarter mile, but we're going to get one inside of a tornado eventually for sure. There- but our, our goal is to keep launching rockets into tornadoes. So before we let you go, go, go into that because, okay. because <laughs> the, the tornado, the path, it, it shifts and changes as it, as it's on the ground. Is that, is that why it's so difficult to, uh, plant these sensors? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and just when you're in the path of a tornado, it is kind of hard to focus to and execute a task. So you really got to concentrate and you have to kind of do it in advance of the tornado to uh, to really record a good data set. We want it to be deployed like five minutes ahead of the tornado or even earlier, potentially. Oh, wow. And I got to deploy a triangle configuration with like a half a kilometer on each side. Oh. So I got to be out there flex taping these sensors that are about uh, kind of shaped like this. You know, this is kind of one of the sensors. Yeah. <clears throat> and I got to, you know, flex tape them to poles or anything that I think will try to survive the tornado, trees even. And as the tornado is approaching, but so far this year, they've been moving so fast. It's been oh. hard and they've been at night. So you're there pitch black. You can hear the roar and you're sitting there flex taping the sensor to a pole. And it's just really hard to do. I mean, it, the second sensor that we were deploying, the tornado was already passing by us in the field to the south. So oh. it, it would have hit us if it was you know, moving head on. Right. Definitely. So. I would have to pee so bad if I'm looking at a tornado, I'm flex sealing, taping this shit to, to a post, and I'm looking at the tornado coming down on me, and I'm like, just got to go, and I, I wouldn't make You're it. too nervous to be a storm I, chaser. I, I'm, Andy's, way, I'm way too Andy's nervous. way too nervous. Well, if you get out this way this week, um, holler at us. We'll buy you dinner or lunch. Yeah, definitely. That'd be awesome to, to meet up and even chase. You know, I hear you're a great driver. Great so driver. Uh, oh, I'm a damn good driver. Yeah, keep in touch. I'll you have my contact information. Yes, sir. Now too. So all right. Well, listen. We'll be back for a big event. We really appreciate you. Uh, you've been more than generous with your time. Stay safe out Thank there. Um, Can I give a shout out real quick? Give whatever you to, want to do to everybody that's friends with me that chases. You heard Reed say that I could go drive with him. He didn't say shit about y'all, so just remember that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. It's a it's a one. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. We appreciate. I think this- we appreciate you, sir. Be safe out there this spring, summer. Like you said, it's a year-round adventure for you, so stay safe. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And like Jeff said, if you ever get out here, we'd love to buy you a hamburger. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys, and uh, yep, thank you for having me. Yes. Never stop chasing. That's right. right. Never stop. Well, God, God bless you, and be safe, Reed. All right. God bless you. Thank Bye. you. Reed the, Timmer. The legend. The legend himself. You know... How many 
small towns, not the big cities, because they got the news cameras and stuff. Do guys like Reed Timmer, how many lives have they saved over the years? A bunch. And, and that's what he said. The, the dichotomy of marveling at something that is going to potentially ruin somebody's life. Yeah, it's going, But it, you got the counterbalance of think of the lives that I'm saving by being out here and gathering the technology that is necessary. Yeah, he, and, and, and he does so much of that. And the other chasers, the guys that are professional chasers that know what they're doing, mm. those guys save a ton of lives. Well, just like he said, you know, if they go through a town that's been hit, they stop and help everybody. He was in more, and he helped people up until midnight. So That, that was a horrible day. That, I'm going to tell you right now, chasing, when you go and something somebody gets hit or oh, wiped out, going. it's a horrible, it's, it's a very, you feel very guilty. Right, because you just got your rocks off at something. Oh, that man, just, God, look at that, look at that. And right. then you realize, you know, it's it's a bad, but bad deal. There's real-world implications. There are, know? but guys like him save so many lives. They do. And and, and, and he's a, he's the guy that, that that everybody knows who he is. Right. And so when he's around, everybody talks about it. Right. I mean, you— It's a big deal. If, it, Reed, oh, if Reed's in your area— there, There's a there's a group Zoom-type deal I'm on. Zelda, or I can't remember the name of the damn thing, and it's it's a Storm Chasers network, and they'll talk. Well, reads at Canyon, reads at you know Childress, or reads at Paducah, reads at Kroll, and you hear you hear his name every day on that deal right. because if he's somewhere, that's where you want to be if you want to see a storm, right? You know, yeah. And that's he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a very humble guy and stuff, and but them guys Great like guy. that save lives, and and the same with the volunteer fireman, that guy that you don't think about that when it storms out mm -hmm. and you're sitting home, he's out there in that fire truck or his own personal truck with the radio. And he says to blow them sirens or not. Those guys are invaluable. The closest I'll get to a tornado is when I'm going to my cellar and then it gets calm. <laughs> that's that's as close as I'll get. <laughs> okay. When it gets real calm and the hair on your arm stands up, how close am I then, Jeff? The little hair standing up is probably lightning's fixing to strike your ass. No, when it gets dead calm. I, I don't know that that's... It goes from wind... Jeff, I've, I've witnessed I, I don't it. know... How many tornadoes have you seen? I've witnessed the calm. Oh, okay, well, yeah, I have witnessed the calm a lot too. I don't. You know. go out. You're right before you go to the cellar. The trees and shit are going everywhere, and then you step outside, and it's just calm. And you're like, oh mother. I'd be more fucker. worried if the wind was blowing about 100 miles an hour out of one direction. Oh, that, that's when you would need to worry. Motherfucker, this is not a good situation. We need to go. Yeah, you're not. You you you're not a st you, storm chaser. I've. You, there's days that you would not be very good. You're too nervous. I don't anyways. have the patience. Number one, it, it is a very patient deal, and it for and it, it's somebody like him, he he's he's so good at what he does and has so much technology, and he's on the spot all the time. For a guy like me, it's it can be very frustrating at times. You get on a storm and it dies, and it blows up, and it dies. He's like, do I want to fall for another hundred miles? Right. And no one probably. The answer to me is no. I yeah, do not. I want to turn around and go home right now. Cut my losses. Yeah. The, the, the bad thing is, is you've been chasing, chasing, chasing since noon, and there'll be the days that they start firing off down here early, and you see a sign right at dark that says Kansas State Line two miles. <laughs> you thought, whew, I got a long drive home. Yeah. And that's happened to me many, 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 many times. That's the bad thing is, no matter how far you drive. You got a high tail at home yep. at some point. The worst one day is at 8.30 at nighttime. It's fixing to get dark, and it's the Texas state line is 15 miles, and I was in New Mexico. Mm. That's a long drive home. But or the worst is when your wife is in the cellar with me, and she says, Jeff Stanfield, you could have just stayed here and chased, and those instead are the, those you're in are Kansas. The bad, those are the bad days. When you're you, in when, Kansas, yes. and you didn't even get rained on. The best storm of the year last year I missed in Knox City, and mm -hmm. I was I – was, Seven was, hours away. No, I was saving Lubbock, Artesia, between, New Mexico. Yeah, between Lubbock and the New Mexico state line, and it happens. But that's part of it, and I enjoy doing it. But when you get on them, it's fun, and it, you feel like a hangover the next day. It's a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. And there are times it's, that I've been very, very worried about what I had done to myself. I thought, well, this is pretty stupid. <laughs> Jeff, you figured it out, man. You just got to ditch it. Stick it in the ditch. You're good Dang, to go. Uh, I'm, that's going to be the last thing I do is stick it in the ditch. Stick it in the ditch. Let it blow over you. But when he said about having to tape his mirrors, I've been there when the mirrors get blown off or big hell knocks mirrors out, and you're like, oh, shit. Mm. I, have right. gotten, I have gotten too close. Let this come out Monday. Got It'll come out Monday. We'll I have chance of storms on Monday. Big outbreak that day. I what? hope it's not too big because I'm going to be turkey hunting. You know, really, you know what really scared me? 2011, 2011, When he kept saying that. You too? That's what I kept hearing, well, too. No, but God dang, we don't need another drought like that. All right. But, I mean, if, if we can get – everything wet enough and maybe fill things up what sucks is last year the, the rain shut off in july and you would figure 
we got all of our shit full. It's July. It's going to make it six weeks. And it did not. No, it was horrible dry. It's because the government pulled the plug out from under our ply lakes. Because if you listen to Tony, oh God, the government go. has it out for duck and goose hunters in West Texas. Yeah. That's why our lakes dried up so fast. Okay. Uh, before everybody else here thinks Tony's fucking crazier than we do. Oh. Uh, thank you all for listening to us. Uh, I'll be at Ducks next weekend. It'll be this weekend. It'll be when this, this weekend. Yeah, when yeah. this weekend comes out. Come 8th out. Ninth. Almost every one of our sponsors is going to be there. Come by, see them, say hello, tell them you heard about them Spend on the Big some Conquer money podcast. With them. Spend, Spend some, some money. money. They all make a great product. Uh, so yes. I mean, it's not we're, we're not co- we're not paired with anybody that that is like, oh, you know, their sh- stuff kind of stinks. Come by. Pacific's going to be there. Shin Gear, uh, Gun Dog, uh, uh, Dirty Gap, Duck, Dirty Duck, Pacific Calls, Boss, Boss. Uh, there's a bunch of them. So come out, spend some money with them. Anybody that's going to be Su- there that's not. Support people that support this podcast because it's the right thing Shin to do. Shin Gear Gun Dog, Boss, Pacific, Dirty Duck, Lucky yes. Duck. Yes, yes, Lucky Duck. And Jeff Stanfield will be there. There you go. Anyways, thank y'all for listening to us. God bless y'all and have a great week. Bye, everybody. Go check out our sponsors. Like Jeff said, if you are in the fort worth area this weekend head out to ducks say hi to everybody boss shot shells pacific calls dive bomb industries alpha outdoor specialty shin gear dirty duck coffee lucky duck looking glass duck club podcast gun dog outdoors steak plains meats bang tail whiskey stanford hunt outfitters <laughs>